Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Scientia, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Jim Pomerantz, professor of psychology and director of Scientia. This is our opening lecture of the academic year, uh, and it's the first in a series that we hope you will find enjoyable as well as illuminating on the theme this year of animals and humans. Uh, we have a highly regarded member of Rice's philosophy department to get us started in the right direction today, and Alistair Norcross and it will be my pleasure to introduce Alistair in just a few minutes. But first, uh, let me set the backdrop for those of you who haven't joined us before or who don't remember the drill from previous years. Uh, but Scientia is an institute for the history of science and culture that was founded in 1981 by the mathematician and historian of science, Solomon Bachner. Um, Scientia is a creature of the Rice faculty, but its goal is to present speakers and programs for the widest possible audience, bringing together faculty, students, staff, alumni, and friends uh, to join in the conversation. We aim to attract our colleagues uh, from across Houston, including our friends across the street and the adjacent Texas Medical Center, uh, and of course our neighbors who we're always uh, glad to see on campus. Uh, it's a pleasure, as always, to recognize the members of Rice's academic leadership who join us uh, for these uh, occasions, including our own president, David Lebron, who's back with us again today. Uh, several of our faithful deans, Kathy Matthews, usually to be found in the nosebleed section on the upper right, Dean, uh, Dean McIntyre and the others. We appreciate your showing uh, 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 your interest in and respect for the Rice faculty by uh, attending these talks. You may know that Rice has, the, uh, Rice has given the primary oversight responsibility uh, for the Delang conferences to Scientia. Um, and uh, the last uh, Delang conference was held on this campus back in March. Uh, it was a roaring success, a uh, conference on molecular medicine. We're in the process now of laying down plans, not just for the next Delang conference, but for the next one after that. So if you have ideas for how we might pursue that, please be in touch uh, either with me or with Steve Kroll of the philosophy department who heads that particular operation. Uh, Scientia also from time to time hosts special events relating to uh, pressing matters on the global, national, or regional front. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce we'll be hosting one such event one week from today uh, where we'll have a special forum focusing on Hurricane Katrina and its implications uh, for Houston going forward, including a glimpse of what might happen should the next Katrina strike here. Uh, Co-sponsoring this special panel with Ciencia will be the Houston Chronicle, um, represented by Susan Bischoff. Uh, and our panel so far includes Rice's own Bob Stein, who may be here with us, uh, Phil Bedient, uh, Scientia's own Steve Kleinberg, who is with us uh, over here, uh, Houston Mayor Bill White, uh, and we hope uh, others uh, whose names will be announced shortly. So look for notices that would be going out sometime in the next couple of days, confirming that next Wednesday, September 21st at 5 p.m., there will be this special panel. Um, so our theme, oh, as always, I would like to thank the people who make uh, these uh, colloquia possible, uh, most particularly our executive assistant, Ellen Butler, who makes sure that we uh, 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 keep the series running on time and running in the right direction. And I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Rice's IT staff who make sure that all the technology works, including the webcasting of these lectures. So for those of you who missed the occasional lecture, who missed any last year, all of those webcasts are archived on the web and you can watch them at your uh, leisure. Uh, so our theme this year is entitled Animals and Humans. Uh, as is true every year, this theme is developed by a group of Rice faculty members, headed again this year by Professor David Queller uh, of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. You could read more about that theme on uh, our program cards uh, or on the web, uh, but let me just quote briefly from our program blurb, which explains what this theme is all about for this year. Humans have always lived in the midst of animals and in the process have developed complex relationships with them. Animals have served as our companions, as our religious figures, and as the manifestations of natural beauty. At the same time, we have relied on animals for food, clothing, transportation, muscle power, and in some cases, we have reinvented animals, selecting for traits that help or please us. In this series, we take a fresh look at how we view animals as some of the old relationships fade away while others emerge, such as genetic engineering and the involvement of animals in research. From Darwin, we learned that humans are animals. There's certainly plenty of us here in this room. 
Humans are akin to apes, monkeys, and other mammals. But to understand the human condition, it behooves us to consider our closest kin. Are other animals mere biological machines, or do they have brains and minds similar to our own? Under what circumstances are we entitled to eat them, to experiment on them, through de or through design or neglect, to extinguish entire species of them? So that's the idea. So following Alistair's talk today, we have three other colloquia scheduled, and a few more still in the planning stage. On uh, October 18th, uh, we'll hear from Ciencia veteran Lisa Meffert, who's right here in the fourth row, uh, has spoken to us before. Uh, she'll be talking on humans as custodians of the animal kingdom concerns in conservation biology. And then on November 15th, we'll hear from another Ciencia veteran, Jack Zamito, who's right over there. Um, and then rounding out the schedule for the semester, we will have Huda Zogby uh, from um, uh, Pediatrics and Neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine. And for those of you who attended the fourth uh, DeLine conference uh, on neuroscience, you'll know that Huda Zogby is an incredible speaker. So. I'd urge you to make all of these. Uh, in the spring, we'll continue with further talks. Uh, we'll hear from Kerry Wolf in English department and from our friend and colleague, Tony Wright, who's seated right here in the third row from University of Texas Medical uh, Center at Houston across the street. We're in the process of nailing down our Bachner lecture, which we will probably hold in March and will possibly co-sponsor with the Houston Zoo. Uh, before, I note, uh, before I introduce Alistair, let me note the uh, format for today. It's slightly different from one that we followed in our last few, at least, in that we have a panel with us today. Um, Alistair will speak for about uh, 40 minutes, uh, and then um, at that point we will uh, hear in an order yet to be determined, perhaps from Joan Strassman from Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. I think all of you uh, know Joan. Uh, because she's a regular attendee at Sancha, but also a regular participant, and was in fact our lead-off speaker in a wonderful talk uh, here. Not to put pressure on you, Alistair. <laughs> a wonderful talk uh, here uh, last September when we kicked off our series last year, uh, and then from Hannah Scheinman from Rice's Philosophy Department, who's uh, um, uh, an expert on some matters that overlap with Alistair. Uh, and so we'll hear those two different perspectives. Uh, then afterwards, uh, we'll have 15 minutes or so for question and answer, followed by uh, reception with uh, drink and food. I don't know if that will include meat. Uh, <laughs> out in the foyer, uh, where you can continue the conversation with uh, Alistair and with the panelists, and of course, talk among ourselves. So uh, now for the reason why we're here today, to hear from our speaker, Professor Alistair J. Norcross of Rice's Department of Philosophy. Uh, Alistair received his BA in Classics, uh, basically in Literature and Philosophy, from Christ Church Oxford University in 1983. He then went on to his graduate degrees, the MA and PhD in Philosophy from Syracuse University, he received his PhD in 1991 on a, with a dissertation on moral conflicts and moral psychology. Uh, after a stretch at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in New York, um, Alistair spent some time at SMU up in Dallas where he was the Easterwood Associate Professor of Philosophy. And then we snared Alistair, got him down here at Rice uh, in, 19, in 2002, and we'll hope he'll be staying for a long time. Uh, among his awards, Alistair won several during his stretch at SMU, including the President's Associate Outstanding Faculty Award, uh, the ethics develop, an Ethics Development Grant, uh, McGuire Teaching Fellowship, and a Curricular Development Grant for Social and Political Philosophy, and a Sam Taylor Fellowship. He's a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Moral Philosophy, and he serves as well as a referee for the Journal of Ethics, as well as for the Canadian Journal of Philosophy, Philosophical Studies, Philosophical Quarter Pacific Philosophical Quarterly, uh, Philosophy and Phenomenological Research, uh, the Journal of Philosophical Research, and the Southern Journal of Philosophy. He's a member of the American Philosophical Association. He currently serves as president of the Southwestern Philosophical Society, having previously served as vice president, and he's been president of the North Texas Philosophical Association. Uh, he's the co-editor of the uh, 1994 uh, anthology, Killing and Let Die. You know, two of our series uh, the past two years have dealt with kind of grim and gloomy topics, and those of you with good memories may note that I promised you last spring that our theme this year would be much more uplifting and positive, um, and I'm sure it will be going forward. Uh, <laughs> 
that said, Alistair's book in progress is called The Road to Hell. <laughs> Alistair is the author of dozens of articles published in such outlets as the Oxford Handbook of, Bi Handbook of Bioethics, the Blackwell Contemporary Debates and Moral Theory, Philosophical Studies, and Philosophical Perspectives, where an article uh, bearing the same title as Alistair's talk today uh, appeared in a 2004 uh, issue. So let me ask you, as always, to turn off your cell phones. I've just turned mine off. Anything else that beeps or makes unpleasant noises and turn into Alistair Norcross, whose title is Puppies, Pigs, and People Eating Meat and Marginal Cases. Alistair Norcross. Thank you, Jim. Um, can you hear me at the back? Yes, excellent. Um, <clears throat> talking about uh, uh, grim topics, the anthology I edited was called Killing and Letting Die. It deals, among other things, with uh, euthanasia. I dedicated it to my uh, reasonably elderly parents, and when they show it to visitors, the <laughs> visitors ask them if I was trying to tell them something. But <laughs> no, uh, well, you know, except thanks for raising me, and you know, hurry up and give me my inheritance. Um, <laughs> Um, I will actually uh, pretty much read uh, uh, what I have because I spent quite a long time writing it and uh, I'm, I particularly like some of the jokes in it, so I want to make sure I get them right. So you'll forgive me for not just wandering around and, and, and talking. Um, uh, and uh, you should have a handout, or some of you have a handout. For those who do, I apologize for the footnote. The spirit of Dr. Seuss seized me and forced me to write what I did in, in that footnote. So blame him. Um, okay, um, let's start with a story, a story of Fred, who receives a visit from the police one day. They've been summoned by Fred's neighbors, who have been disturbed by strange sounds emanating from Fred's basement. When they enter the basement, they are confronted by the following scene. Twenty-six small wire cages, each containing a puppy. Some whining, some whimpering, some howling. The puppies range in age from newborn to about six months. Many of them show signs of mutilation. Urine and feces cover the bottoms of the cages and the basement floor. Uh, Fred explains that he keeps the puppies for 26 weeks and then butchers them while holding them upside down. During their lives, he performs a series of mutilations on them, such as slicing off their noses and their paws with a hot knife, all without any form of anesthesia. Except for the mutilations, the puppies are never allowed out of their cages, which are barely big enough to hold them at 26 weeks. The police are horrified and promptly charge Fred with animal abuse. As details of the case are publicized, the public is outraged. Newspapers are flooded with letters demanding that Fred be severely punished. There are calls for more severe penalties for animal abuse. Fred is denounced as a vile sadist. Finally, at his trial, Fred explains his behavior and argues that he is blameless and therefore deserves no punishment. He is, he explains, a great lover of chocolate. A couple of years ago, he was involved in a car accident which resulted in some head trauma. Upon his release from hospital, having apparently suffered no lasting ill effects, he visited his favorite restaurant and ordered their famous rich, dark chocolate mousse. Well, imagine his dismay when he discovered that his experience of the moose was a pale shadow of its former self. The moose tasted bland, slightly pleasant, but with none of the intense chocolatey flavor he remembered so well. The waiter assured him that the recipe was unchanged from the last time he tasted it, just the day before his accident. In some consternation, Fred rushed out to buy a bar of his favorite Belgian chocolate. Again, he was dismayed to discover that the experience of the chocolate was barely even pleasurable. Extensive investigation revealed that his experience of other foods remained unaffected. But chocolate in all its forms now tasted bland and insipid. Desperate for a solution to his problem, Fred visited a renowned gustatory neurologist, Dr. T. Budd. <laughs> Extensive tests revealed that the accident had irreparably damaged the Godiva gland which secretes cocomone, as you all know, the hormone responsible for the experience of chocolate. 
Fred urgently requested hormone replacement therapy. Dr. Bard informed him that until recently there had been no known source of cocomone other than the human Godiva gland, and that it was impossible to collect cocomone from one person to be used by another. However, a chance discovery had altered the situation. A forensic veterinary surgeon performing an autopsy on a severely abused puppy had discovered high concentrations of cocomone in the puppy's brain. It turned out that puppies, who don't normally produce cocomone, could be stimulated to do so by extended periods of severe stress and suffering. The research which led to this discovery, while gaining tenure for its authors, had not been widely publicized for fear of antagonizing animal welfare groups. Although this research clearly gave Fred the hope of tasting chocolate again, there were no commercially available sources of puppy-derived cocomone. A lack of demand, combined with fear of bad publicity, had deterred drug companies from getting into the puppy-torturing business. Fred appeals to the court to imagine his anguish on discovering that a solution to his severe deprivation was possible, but not readily available. But he wasn't inclined to sit around bemoaning his cruel fate. He did what any chocolate lover would do. He read the research and set up his own cocomone collection lab in his basement. Six months of intense puppy suffering, followed by a brutal death, produced enough cocomone to last him a week, hence the 26 cages. Now, he isn't a sadist or an animal abuser, he explains. If there were a method of collecting cocomone without torturing puppies, he would gladly employ it. He derives no pleasure from the suffering of the puppies itself. He sympathizes with those who are horrified by the pain and misery of the animals, but the court must realize that human pleasure is at stake. The puppies, while undeniably cute, are mere animals. He admits that he would be just as healthy without chocolate, if not more so, but this isn't a matter of survival or health. His life would be unacceptably impoverished without the experience of chocolate. End of story. Well, clearly, we are horrified by Fred's behavior and unconvinced by his attempted justification. It is, of course, unfortunate for Fred that he can no longer enjoy the taste of chocolate, but that in no way excuses the imposition of severe suffering on the puppies. Now, I expect near universal agreement with this claim, the exceptions being those who are either inhumanly callous or thinking ahead and wish to avoid the conclusion to which the argument commits them. <laughs> so most of my colleagues in the philosophy department have already worked out clever ways of avoiding it, I'm sure. However, I will go on with my uh, bluster. No decent person would even contemplate torturing puppies merely to enhance a gustatory experience. However, billions of animals endure intense suffering every year for precisely this end. And that's not an exaggeration, approximately nine billion in this country alone. Most of the chicken, veal, beef, and pork consumed in the United States comes from intensive confinement facilities in which the animals live cramped, cramped stress-filled lives and endure unanesthetized mutilations. The vast majority of people would suffer no ill health from the elimination of meat from their diets, quite the reverse. The supposed benefits from this system of factory farming, apart from the profits accruing to agribusiness, are increased levels of gustatory pleasure for those who claim that they couldn't enjoy a meat-free diet as much as their current meat-filled diets. If we are prepared to condemn Fred for torturing puppies merely to enhance his gustatory experiences, shouldn't we similarly condemn the millions who purchase and consume factory-raised meat? Are there any morally significant differences between Fred's behavior and their behavior? So I'm going to consider a few attempts to come up with those differences, and these are enumerated on your handout. The first difference that might seem to be relevant is that Fred tortures the puppies himself, whereas most Americans consume meat that comes from animals that have been tortured by others. But is this really relevant? What if Fred had been squeamish and had employed someone else to torture the puppies and extract the cocomone? Would we have thought any better of Fred? Of course not. Well, how about another one? Another difference between Fred and many consumers of factory-raised meat is that many, perhaps most such consumers, are unaware of the treatment of the animals before they appear in neatly wrapped packages on supermarket shelves. 
Perhaps I should moderate my challenge then. If we are prepared to condemn Fred for torturing puppies merely to enhance his gustatory experiences, shouldn't we similarly condemn those who purchase and consume factory-raised meat in full or even partial awareness of the suffering endured by the animals? While many consumers are still blissfully ignorant of the appalling treatment meted out to meat, that number is rapidly dwindling, thanks to vigorous publicity campaigns waged by animal welfare groups. Furthermore, any meat-eating members of this audience are now deprived of the excuse of ignorance. Well, perhaps a consumer of factory-raised meat could argue as follows. While I agree that Fred's behavior is abominable, mine is crucially different. If Fred did not consume his chocolate, he would not raise and torture puppies or pay someone else to do so. Therefore, Fred could prevent the suffering of the puppies. However, if I did not buy and consume factory-raised meat, no animals would be spared lives of misery. Agribusiness is much too large to respond to the behavior of one consumer. Therefore, I cannot prevent the suffering of any animals. I may well regret the suffering inflicted on animals for the sake of human enjoyment. I may even agree that the human enjoyment doesn't justify the suffering. However, since the animals will suffer no matter what I do, I may as well enjoy the taste of their flesh. Well, there are at least two lines of response to this attempted defense. First, consider an analogous case. You visit a friend in an exotic location, say, Alabama. Your friend takes you out to eat at the finest restaurant in Tuscaloosa. For dessert, you select the house specialty, chocolate mousse Alabama, served with a small cup of coffee, which you are instructed to drink before eating the mousse. The mousse is quite simply the most delicious dessert you have ever tasted. Never before has chocolate tasted so rich and satisfying. Tempted to order a second, you ask your friend, what makes this mousse so delicious? He informs you that the mousse itself is ordinary, but the coffee contains a concentrated dose of cocomone, the newly discovered chocolate-enhancing hormone. Researchers at Auburn University have perfected a technique for extracting cocomone from the brains of freshly slaughtered puppies who have been subjected to lives of pain and frustration. Each puppy's brain yields four doses, each of which is effective for about 15 minutes, just long enough to enjoy one serving of mousse. You are naturally horrified and disgusted. You will not consider ordering another serving, you tell your friend. In fact, you are shocked that your friend, who had always seemed to be a morally decent person, could have both recommended the dessert to you and eaten one himself in full awareness of the loathsome process necessary for the experience. He agrees that the suffering of the puppies is outrageous and that the gain in human pleasure in no way justifies the appalling treatment they have to endure. However, neither he nor you can save any puppies by refraining from consuming cocomone. Cocomone production is now Alabama's leading industry, surpassing even banjo making and inbreeding. <laughs> now I, I realize that I'm playing on stereotypes for comic effect here. Banjo making, of course, has never been one of Alabama's leading industries. <clears throat> the industry is much too large to respond to the behavior of one or two consumers, and Blackwell's made me take that out. They were afraid of losing customers in Alabama. Uh, <clears throat> since the puppies will suffer no matter what either of you does, you may as well enjoy the moose. Well, if it is as obvious as it seems that a morally decent person who's aware of the details of Kokomo in production couldn't order chocolate moose Alabama, it should be equally obvious that a morally decent person who's aware of the details of factory farming can't purchase and consume factory-raised meat. If the attempted excuse of causal impotence is compelling in the latter case, it should be compelling in the former case, but it isn't. Now, of course, there is a, a familiar, more compelling version of this example. I put my version in mostly so I could get in the joke about Alabama, but um, the uh, familiar example discussed in the philosophical literature is that of buying a lampshade made from human skin by the Nazis. Um, and you should see that it's exactly parallel to this example. The second response to the claim of causal impotence, the claim that nothing I can do will have any effect on the numbers of animals that suffer, the second response is just to deny the claim itself. Consider the case of chickens. 
the most cruelly treated of all animals raised for human consumption, with the possible exception of veal calves. In 1998, almost 8 billion chickens were slaughtered in the United States. Almost all of them raised on factory farms, about 98%. Suppose that there are 250 million chicken eaters in the United States, and that each one consumes on average 25 chickens per year. These are just you know, guesses. It doesn't really matter if the numbers aren't exactly right. Now, clearly, if only one of those chicken eaters gave up eating chicken, the industry would not respond. Equally clearly, if they all gave up eating chicken, billions of chickens would not be bred, tortured, and killed. But there must be some number of consumers, far short of 250 million, whose renunciation of chicken would cause the industry to reduce the number of chickens bred in factory farms. The industry may not be able to respond to each individual's behavior, but it must respond to the behavior of fairly large numbers. So suppose that the industry is sensitive to a reduction in demand for chicken, equivalent to, say, 10,000 people becoming vegetarians, or at least giving up chicken. For each group of 10,000, then, who give up chicken, a quarter of a million fewer chickens are bred per year. It appears, then, that if you give up eating chicken, you have only a 1 in 10,000 chance of making any difference to the lives of chickens, unless it is certain that fewer than 10,000 people will ever give up eating chicken, in which case you have no chance. Isn't a 1 in 10,000 chance small enough to render your continued consumption of chicken blameless? Not at all. While the chance that your behavior is harmful may be small, the harm that is risked is enormous. The larger the numbers needed to make a difference to chicken production, the larger the difference such numbers would make, which is why it doesn't actually matter if I've got the specific numbers right. A 1 in 10,000 chance of saving 250,000 chickens per year from excruciating lives is morally and mathematically equivalent to the certainty of saving 25 chickens per year. We commonly accept that even small risks of great harms are unacceptable. That is why we disapprove of parents who fail to secure their children in car seats or with seat belts, or who leave their small children unattended at home, or who drink or smoke heavily during pregnancy. Or consider commercial airline safety measures. The chances that the oxygen masks, the life jackets, or the emergency exits on any given plane will be called on to save any lives in a given week are far smaller than one in 10,000. And yet we would be outraged to discover that an airline had knowingly allowed a plane to fly for a week with non-functioning emergency exits, oxygen masks, and life jackets. So even if it is true that your giving up factory-raised chicken has only a tiny chance of preventing suffering, given that the amount of suffering that would be prevented is in inverse proportion to your chance of preventing it, your continued consumption is not thereby excused. But perhaps it is not even true that your giving up chicken has only a tiny chance of making any difference. Suppose again that the poultry industry only reduces production when a threshold of 10,000 fresh vegetarians is reached. Suppose also, as is almost certainly true, that vegetarianism is growing in popularity in the United States and elsewhere. Then even if you are not the one newly converted vegetarian to reach the next threshold of 10,000, your conversion will reduce the time required before the next threshold is reached. The sooner the threshold is reached, the sooner production and therefore animal suffering is reduced. Your behavior, therefore, does make a difference. Furthermore, many people who become vegetarians influence others to become vegetarians, who in turn influence others, and so on. It appears then that the claim of causal impotence is mere wishful thinking on the part of those meat lovers who are morally sensitive enough to realize that human gustatory pleasure does not justify inflicting extreme suffering on animals. Well, perhaps there is a further difference between the treatment of Fred's puppies and the treatment of animals on factory farms. The suffering of the puppies is a necessary means to the production of gustatory pleasure, whereas the suffering of animals on factory farms is simply a byproduct of the conditions dictated by economic considerations. Therefore, it might be argued the suffering of the puppies is intended as a means to Fred's pleasure, whereas the suffering of factory-raised animals is merely foreseen as a side effect of a system that is a means to the gustatory pleasure of millions. The distinction between what is intended, either as a means or as an end, or an end in itself, and what is merely foreseen, is central to the doctrine of the double effect. Supporters of this claim 
doctrine claim that it is sometimes permissible to bring about an effect that is merely foreseen, even though the very same effect could not permissibly be brought about if intended. Well, so Fred acts impermissibly according to this line of argument because he intends the suffering of the puppies as a means to his pleasure. Most meat eaters, on the other hand, even if aware of the suffering of the animals, do not intend the suffering. Well, in response to this line of argument, I could remind the reader that Samuel Johnson said, or should have said, that the doctrine of double effect is the last refuge of a scoundrel. I won't do that, however, <clears throat> since neither the doctrine itself nor the alleged moral distinction between intending and foreseeing can justify the consumption of factory-raised meat. Um, I'll skip the next bit. It would be easy to modify the story of Fred to render the puppy's suffering merely foreseen. For example, suppose that the cocomone is produced by a chemical reaction that can only occur when large quantities of drain cleaner are forced down the throat of a conscious, unanesthetized puppy. The consequent appalling suffering, while not itself a means to the production of cocomone, is nonetheless an unavoidable side effect of the means. In this variation of the story, Fred's behavior is no less abominable than in the original. Well, one last difference between the behavior of Fred and the behavior of the consumers of factory-raised meat is worth discussing, if only because it is so frequently cited in response to these kind of arguments. Fred's behavior is abominable, according to this line of thinking, because it involves the suffering of puppies. The behavior of meat eaters, on the other hand, merely involves the suffering of chickens, pigs, cows, calves, sheep, and the like. Puppies, and probably dogs and cats in general, are morally different from the other animals. Puppies count, morally that is, whereas the other animals don't, or at least not nearly as much. So, what gives puppies a higher moral status than the animals we eat? Presumably there is some morally relevant property or properties possessed by puppies, but not by farm animals. Perhaps puppies have a greater degree of rationality than farm animals, or a more finely developed moral sense, or at least a sense of loyalty and devotion. Well, the problems with this kind of approach are obvious. It's highly unlikely that any property that has even an outside chance of being ethically relevant is both possessed by puppies and not possessed by any farm animals. For example, it's probably true that most puppies have a greater degree of rationality, whatever that means exactly, than most chickens. But the comparison with pigs is far more dubious. Besides, if Fred were to inform the jury that he had taken pains to acquire particularly stupid, morally obtuse, disloyal, and undevoted puppies, <laughs> would they or we have declared his behavior to be morally acceptable? Clearly not. This, of course, is simply the puppy version of the problem of marginal cases, which I'll be coming to in a couple of minutes. The human version is no less relevant. If their lack of certain degrees of rationality, moral sensibility, loyalty, devotion, and the like makes it permissible to torture farm animals for our gustatory pleasure, it should be the same. It should be permissible to do the same to those unfortunate humans who also lack those properties. Since the latter behavior isn't permissible, the lack of such properties doesn't justify the former behavior. Well, perhaps though, there is something that separates puppies, even marginal puppies, and marginal humans for that matter, from farm animals, and that is our sympathy. Puppies count more than other animals because we care more about them. We are outraged to hear of puppies abused in scientific experiments but unconcerned at the treatment of laboratory rats or animals on factory farms. Before the 2002 World Cup, several members of the England football team, that's real football, um, <laughs> sent a letter to the government of South Korea protesting the treatment of dogs and cats raised for food in that country. The same players have not protested the treatment of animals on factory farms in England. Well, this example, while clearly illustrating the difference in attitudes towards cats and dogs on the one hand and farm animals on the other, also reveals one of the problems with this approach to the question of moral status. Although the English footballers and the English and United States public in general clearly care far more about the treatment of cats and dogs than of farm animals, the South Koreans just as clearly do not. Are we to conclude that Fred's behavior would not be abominable were he living in South Korea? where dogs and cats are routinely abused for the sake of gustatory pleasure? Such relativism is, to put it mildly, hard to swallow. Perhaps, though, we can maintain the view that human feelings determine the moral status of animals without condoning the treatment of dogs and cats in South Korea and other countries. Not all human feelings count. 
only the feelings of those who have achieved exactly the right degree of moral sensibility. That just so happens to be those in countries like the United States and Britain who care deeply for the welfare of dogs and cats, but not particularly for the welfare of cows, chickens, pigs, and other factory-raised animals. Dog and cat eaters in South Korea are insufficiently sensitive, and humane farming advocates in Britain and the United States are overly sensitive. But of course, it won't do simply to insist that this is the right degree of moral sensibility. We need an explanation of why this is the right degree of sensibility. Moral sensibility consists, at least in part, in reacting differently to different features of situations, actions, agents, and patients. If the right degree of moral sensibility requires reacting differently to puppies and to farm animals, there must be a morally relevant difference between puppies and farm animals. Such a difference can't simply consist in the fact that some people do react differently to them. The appeal to differential human sympathy illustrates a purely descriptive psychological difference between the behavior of Fred and that of someone who knowingly consumed consumes factory-raised meat, it can do no serious moral work. Well, I've been unable to discover any morally relevant differences between the behavior of Fred, the puppy torturer, and the behavior of the millions of people who purchase and consume factory-raised meat, at least those who do so in the knowledge that the animals live lives of suffering and deprivation. If morality demands that we not torture puppies merely to enhance our own eating pleasure, morality also demands that we not support factory farming by purchasing factory-raised meat. Well, Perhaps what I have said thus far is enough to convince many that the purchase and consumption of factory-raised meat is immoral. It is clear that the attribution of a different and elevated moral status to puppies from that attributed to farm animals is unjustified. But one philosopher's modus ponens, as they say, is another Texan's modus tollens. Here is the modus ponens. <laughs> I have been arguing, it's a technical term in logic for a kind of argument, and this is on the um, first page of the handout. Premise one, if it's wrong to torture puppies for gustatory pleasure, it's wrong to support factory farming. Premise two, it is wrong to torture puppies for gustatory pleasure. Three, conclusion, therefore it's wrong to support factory farming. But some may be so convinced that supporting factory farming is not wrong that they may substitute that conviction for the second premise and conclude that it is not wrong to torture puppies for gustatory pleasure. Thus, we are confronted with the Texans' modus tollens. Second argument on the handout. Premise T1. If it's wrong to torture puppies for gustatory pleasure, then it's wrong to support factory farming. Premise T2. It's not wrong to support factory farming. Conclusion T3. Therefore, it's not wrong to torture puppies for gustatory pleasure. Now, I'm not saying that there is a large risk that many people, even Texans, will start breeding puppies for food outside of those countries where it is already accepted practice. What they may do, and have done when I presented them with this argument, is explain their reluctance to do so as a mere sentimental preference as opposed to a morally mandated choice. They may claim in a somewhat Kantian spirit that someone who can treat puppies like that may be more likely to mistreat humans they may agree that all animals deserve equal consideration of their interests. And by animals, we mean non-human animals in this context. They may then justify their different treatment of animals, either on the grounds that they are simply giving some animals more than they deserve, or that they are attending to their own interests. If the former, they could claim that morality mandates minimal standards of conduct, but that nothing prevents us from choosing to go beyond the requirements of morality when we feel like it. If the latter, they could claim that their sentimental attachment to puppies, kittens, and the like, makes it in their own interest not to raise and kill them for food. Nonetheless, they may insist, in terms of moral status, there is a clear difference between humans and other animals. Humans have a moral status so far above that of other animals that we couldn't even consider raising humans for food, even humanely, or experimenting on them without their consent even though we routinely do such things to other animals. Well, for the purposes of this discussion, to claim that humans have a superior ethical or moral status to animals, and one other side, I use ethical and moral interchangeably. I know some people draw distinctions. They mean the same thing in my vocabulary. Um, to claim that humans have a superior ethical status to animals is to claim that it is morally right to give the interests of humans greater weight than those of animals in deciding how to behave. Now, such claims will often be couched in terms of rights, such as the right to liberty or respect, but nothing turns on this terminological matter. 
One may claim that it's generally wrong to kill humans, but not animals, because humans are rational and animals are not. Or one may claim that the suffering of animals counts less than the suffering of humans, if at all, because humans are rational and animals are not. These claims may proceed through the intermediate claim that the rights of humans are more extensive and stronger than those, if any, of animals. Alternatively, one may directly ground the judgment about the moral status of certain types of behavior in claims about the alleged natural properties of the individuals involved. So what could ground the claim of superior moral status for humans? Well, just as the defender of a higher moral status for puppies than for farm animals needs to find some property or properties possessed by puppies but not by farm animals, so the defender of a higher moral status for humans needs to find some property or properties possessed by humans but not by other animals. The traditional view, dating back at least to Aristotle, is that rationality is what separates humans, both morally and metaphysically, from other animals. With a greater understanding of the cognitive powers of some animals, recent philosophers have often refined the claim to stress the kind and level of rationality required for moral reasoning. So um, let me give you some representative claims. Um, here's Bonnie Steinbach on the issue. It's not arbitrary or smug, I think, to maintain that human beings have a different moral status from members of other species because of certain capacities which are characteristic of being human. We may not all be equal in these capacities, but all human beings possess them to some measure, and non-human animals do not. For example, human beings are normally held to be responsible for what they do. Secondly, human beings can be expected to reciprocate in a way that non-human animals cannot. Thirdly, there is the desire for self-respect. Mary Ann Warren says that people are at least sometimes capable of being moved to action or inaction by the force of reasoned argument. And that contrasts with animals' inability. Carl Cohen, one of the most vehement modern defenders of what Peter Singer calls speciesism, states his position as follows. Quote, between species of animate life, however, between, for example, humans on the one hand and cats or rats on the other, the morally relevant differences are enormous and almost universally appreciated. Humans engage in moral reflection. Humans are morally autonomous. Humans are members of moral communities, recognizing just claims against their interests. Human beings do have rights. Theirs is a moral status very different from that of cats or rats." End of quote. So the claim is that human interests and or rights are stronger or more important than those of animals because humans possess a kind and level of rationality not possessed by animals. Now, how much of our current behavior towards animals this justifies depends on just how much consideration should be given to animal interests and on what rights, if any, they possess. Both Steinbock and Warren stress that animal interests need to be taken seriously into account. Warren claims that animals have important rights, but just not as important as human rights. Cohen, on the other hand, argues that we should actually increase our use of animals in research. Well, one of the most serious challenges to this defense of the traditional view involves a consideration of what philosophers refer to as marginal cases. Whatever kind and level of rationality is selected as justifying the attribution of superior moral status to humans will either be lacking in some humans or present in some animals. To take one of the most commonly suggested features, many humans are incapable of engaging in moral reflection. For some, this capacity, incapacity is temporary, as is the case with infants or the temporarily cognitively disabled. Others who once had the capacity may have permanently lost it, as is the case with the severely senile or the irreversibly comatose. Still others never had and never will have the capacity, as is the case with the severely mentally disabled. If we base our claims for the moral superiority of humans over animals on the attribution of such capacities, won't we have to exclude many humans? Won't we then be forced to the claim that there is at least as much moral reason to use cognitively deficient humans in experiments and for food as to use animals? Perhaps we could exclude the only temporarily disabled on the grounds of potentiality, though that move has its own problems. Nonetheless, the other two categories will be vulnerable to this objection, the permanently disabled. Well, I will consider two lines of response to the argument from marginal cases. The first denies that we have to attribute different moral status to marginal humans, 
but maintains that we are nonetheless justified in attributing different moral status to animals who are just as cognitively sophisticated as marginal humans, if not more so. The second admits that, strictly speaking, marginal humans are morally inferior to other humans, but proceeds to claim pragmatic reasons for treating them at least usually as if they had equal status. So um, I'm only going to give you Carl Cohen's account because this is the, the one which is best known. Here's what Carl Cohen has to say in response to the argument from marginal cases. The argument from marginal cases fails. It mistakenly treats an essential feature of humanity as though it were a screen for sorting humans. The capacity for moral judgment that distinguishes humans from animals is not a test to be administered to human beings one by one. Persons who are unable because of some disability to perform the full moral functions natural to human beings are certainly not for that reason ejected from the moral community. The issue is one of kind. What humans retain when disabled, animals have never had. It's the end of that quote. Well, there is something deeply troublesome about this line of argument. A particular feature or set of features is claimed to have so much moral significance that its presence or lack can make the difference to whether a piece of behavior is morally justified or morally outrageous. But then it is claimed that the presence or lack of the feature in any particular case is not important. The relevant question is whether the presence or lack of the feature is normal. Such an argument would seem perfectly preposterous in most other cases. Suppose, for example, that 10 famous people are on trial in the afterlife for crimes against humanity. On the basis of conclusive evidence, five are found guilty and five are found not guilty. Four of the guilty are sentenced to an eternity of torment, and one is granted an eternity of bliss. Four of the innocent are granted an eternity of bliss, and one is sentenced to an eternity of torment. The one innocent who is sentenced to torment asks why he, and not the fifth guilty person, must go to hell. St. Peter replies, isn't it obvious, Mr. Gandhi? You are male. The other four men, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, George W. Bush, and Milton Friedman, are all guilty. <laughs> Therefore, the normal condition for a male defendant in this trial is guilt. The fact that you happen to be innocent is irrelevant. Likewise, of the five female defendants in this trial, only one was guilty. Therefore, the normal condition for female defendants in this trial is innocence. That is why Margaret Thatcher gets to go to heaven instead of you. <laughs> I take it there'll be no disputing the relevance of the examples here. <coughs> I'm sorry, I, I couldn't resist. Hanok told me I should use less controversial uh, figures, but that's not in my nature. As I said, such an argument is preposterous. Is the reply to the argument from marginal cases any better? Perhaps it will be claimed that a biological category such as species is more natural, whatever that means, than a category like all the male or female defendants in this trial. Even setting aside the not inconsiderable worries about the conventionality of biological categories, it is not at all clear why this distinction should be morally relevant. What if it turned out that there were statistically relevant differences in the mental abilities of men and women? Suppose that men were on average more skilled at manipulating numbers than women, and that women were, on average, more empathetic than men. Would such differences in what was normal for men and women justify us in preferring an innumerate man to a female math genius for a job as an accountant, or an insensitive woman to an ultra-sympathetic man for a job as a counselor? I take it that the biological distinction between male and female is just as real as that between human and chimpanzee. A second response to the argument from marginal cases is to concede the cognitively deficient humans really do have an inferior moral status to normal humans. Can we then use such humans as we do animals? I know of no one who takes the further step of advocating the use of marginal humans for food, although R.G. Fry has made suggestive remarks concerning experimentation and many students have made such remarks concerning the inmates of federal prisons. How can we advocate this second response while blocking the further step? Well, Warren suggests there are powerful practical and emotional reasons for protecting non-rational human beings, reasons which are absent in the case of most non-human animals. 
It would clearly outrage common human sensibilities if we were to raise retarded children for food or medical experiments. And um, Barney Steinbock says some very similar things, which, for the sake of time, I'll skip over. Well, this line of response clearly won't satisfy those who think that marginal humans really do deserve equal moral consideration with other humans. It is also a very shaky basis on which to justify our current practices. What outrages human sensibilities is a very fragile thing. Human history is littered with examples of widespread acceptance of the systematic mistreatment of some groups who didn't generate any sympathetic response from others. That we do feel a kind of sympathy for retarded humans that we don't feel for dogs is, if true, a contingent matter. To see just how shaky a basis this is for protecting retarded humans, imagine that a new kind of birth defect, perhaps associated with beef from cows treated with bovine growth hormone, produces a severe mental retardation, green skin, and a complete lack of emotional bond between parents and children. Furthermore, suppose that the mental retardation is of the same kind and severity as that caused by other birth defects that don't have the other two effects, the color of the skin and the lack of emotional bond. It seems likely that denying moral status to such defective humans would not run the same risks of outraging human sensibilities as would the denial of moral status to other less easily distinguished and more loved defective humans. With these contingent empirical differences between our reactions to different sources of mental retardation justify us in ascribing different direct moral status to their subjects? The only difference between them is skin color and whether they are loved by others. Any theory that could ascribe moral relevance to differences such as these doesn't deserve to be taken seriously. Well, finally, perhaps we could claim that the practice of giving greater weight to the interests of all humans than of animals is justified on evolutionary grounds. Perhaps such differential concern has survival value for the species. Something like this may well be true, but it's hard to see the moral relevance. We can hardly justify the privileging of human interests over animal interests on the grounds that such privileging serves human interests. Well, finally, just a couple more minutes. Although the argument from marginal cases certainly poses a formidable challenge to any proposed criterion of full moral standing that excludes animals, it doesn't, in my view, constitute the most serious flaw in such attempts to justify the status quo. The proposed criteria are all variations on the Aristotelian criterion of rationality. But what is the moral relevance of rationality? Why should we think that the possession of a certain level or kind of rationality renders the possessor's interests of greater moral significance than those of a merely sentient being? In Jeremy Bentham's famous words, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Well, what do, alleged, what do defenders of the alleged superiority of human interests say in response to Bentham's challenge, which has been around for 300 years? Some, such as Carl Cohen, simply reiterate the differences between humans and animals that they claim to carry moral significance. Animals are not members of moral communities. They don't engage in moral reflection. They can't be moved by moral reasons. Therefore, their interests don't count as much as ours. To uh, take uh, the quote from the British philosopher Strawson in a different context, that therefore constitutes a non sequitur of numbing grossness. He was talking about Kant, actually. Um, Others, such as Steinbock and Warren, attempt to go further. Now, here's Warren on the subject. Why is rationality morally relevant? It doesn't make us better than other animals or more perfect, but it is morally relevant insofar as it provides greater possibilities for cooperation and for the nonviolent resolution of problems. Well, Warren is certainly correct in claiming that a certain level and kind of rationality is morally relevant. Where she and others who give similar arguments go wrong, is in specifying what the moral relevance amounts to. If a being is incapable of moral reasoning at even the most basic level, if it is incapable of being moved by moral reasons, claims, or arguments, then it cannot be a moral agent. It cannot be subject to moral obligations, to moral play, praise, or blame. Punishing a dog for doing something wrong is no more than an attempt to alter its future behavior. So long as we are undeceived about the dog's cognitive capacities, we are not, except metaphorically, expressing any moral judgment about the dog's behavior. 
All this is well and good. But what is the significance for the question of what weight to give to animal interests? That animals can't be moral agents doesn't seem to be relevant to their status as moral patients. Many, perhaps most humans, are both moral agents and patients. Most, perhaps all animals, are only moral patients. Why would the lack of moral agency give them diminished status as moral patients? Full status as a moral patient is not some kind of reward for moral agency. Well, I've heard students complain in this regard that it is unfair that humans bear the burdens of moral responsibility and don't get enhanced consideration of their interests in return. This is a very strange claim. Humans are subject to moral obligations because they're the kind of creatures who can be. What grounds moral agency is simply different from what grounds moral standing as a patient. It is no more unfair that humans and not animals are moral agents than it is unfair that real animals and not stuffed toys are moral patients. One other attempt to justify the selection of rationality as the criterion of full moral standing is worth considering. Recall the suggestion that rationality is important insofar as it facilitates cooperation. Now, if we view the essence of morality as reciprocity, the significance of rationality is obvious. A certain twisted but all too common interpretation of the golden rule is that we should do unto others in order to get them to do unto us. There's no point, according to this approach, in giving much, if any, consideration to the interests of animals because they are simply incapable of giving like consideration to our interests. In discussing the morality of eating meat, I have many times heard students claim that we are justified in eating meat because the animals would eat us if given half a chance. That they say this in regard to our practice of eating cows and chickens <laughs> is depressing testimony to their knowledge of the animals they gobble up with such gusto. Now, to be fair, this was mostly students at SMU who would raise this <laughs> claim. Inasmuch as there is a consistent view being expressed here at all, it concerns self-interest as opposed to morality. Whether it serves my interests to give the same weight to the interests of animals as to those of humans is an interesting question. But it's not the same question as whether it is right to give animals' interests equal weight. The same point, of course, applies to the question of whether to give equal weight to my interests or those of my family, race, sex, religion, etc., as those of other people. Well, perhaps it will be objected that I'm being unfair to the suggestion that the essence of morality is reciprocity. Reciprocity is important, not because it serves my interests, but because it serves the interests of all. Reciprocity facilitates cooperation, which in turn produces benefits for all. What we should say about this depends on the scope of all. If it includes all sentient beings, then the significance of animals' inability to reciprocate is in what it tells us about how to give their interests equal consideration. It certainly can't tell us that we should give less or no consideration to their interests. If, on the other hand, we claim that rationality is important for reciprocity, which is important for cooperation, which is important for benefiting humans, which is the ultimate goal of morality, we have clearly begged the question against giving equal consideration to the interests of animals. It seems that any attempt to justify the claim that humans have a higher moral status than other animals by appealing to some version of rationality as the morally relevant difference between humans and animals will fail on at least two counts. It will fail to give an adequate answer to the argument from marginal cases, and more importantly, it will fail to make the case that such a difference is morally relevant to the status of animals as moral patients as opposed to their status as moral agents. I conclude that our intuitions that Fred's behavior is morally impermissible are accurate. Furthermore, given that the behavior of those who knowingly support factory farming is morally indistinguishable, it follows that their behavior is also morally reprehensible. Thank you very much, Alistair. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I ate at the salad bar today, so I'm going to sleep like a baby tonight. <laughs> For the rest of you, we have counselors who will be available during the, <laughs> during the reception. Uh, at the risk of letting philosophers have the first and the last word, uh, let us go uh, philosopher, biologist, uh, philosopher. But let me introduce uh, Hannock first, since uh, Hannock Scheinman is newer to Rice, and uh, many of you uh, may not know him. 
Uh, uh, Hennick specializes in legal and political philosophy and is published in a number of prestigious uh, journals, including the Journal of Moral Philosophy, the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, uh, and Law and Philosophy. Uh, he has multiple degrees. His Princeton dissertation examines the relationship between law and justice, and his Yale di dissertation discusses the relationship between legal institutions of contracts and the social institution of promising. He has law degrees from Tel Aviv, Oxford, and Yale, and clerked for a justice on the Israeli Supreme Court in Jerusalem. Uh, Joan Strassman, by contrast, is well known to all of us, uh, especially uh, those of us in the Scientia crowd, the faithful here. Uh, she, as I mentioned before, was our lead-off speaker in this series last year. Uh, Joan still received her undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan and her graduate degree from UT Austin, where she stayed on for a postdoc, then came down here right away and has been on the faculty uh, ever since. Uh, she's won so many awards and honors, I hardly I don't want to begin even listing them, uh, but let me just say that uh, they include this uh, uh, now famous $5 million five-year grant from NSF that I talked about last year um, on evolution of social biological systems, and uh, she's the winner of the Chance Prize for Teaching, and last year was on a Guggenheim uh, Fellowship. So let's start uh, with Hannick, or excuse me, with John. <laughs> I agree with Professor Norcross's view against factory farming. Chicken are chickens are crowded into tiny cages with their beaks mutilated. Cattle are fed grains that upset their digestive system. Pigs are perhaps the most intelligent of the bunch and they're housed in unspeakable conditions. You can peruse any number of websites that document how terribly we treat animals. And yet in our day-to-day -day lives, these costs are hidden to us. But I'd argue for a somewhat broader view. Our economy hides lots of costs besides overt animal cruelty. For example, half of the 50 million pounds of antibiotics produced annually in the US are given to animals, setting up a great evolutionary experiment selecting four antibiotic resistant bacteria. Who needs terrorists? And consider habitat loss. I drove from St. Louis to Champaign across Illinois this summer. The cornfields that stretch from one horizon to the other are there to feed cattle and to feed our sugar addiction. Later in the summer, I drove east from Fort Collins, Colorado and passed overgrazed land and feedlots with passive cattle standing in their own manure. If I had been in other parts of the country, I might have passed chicken factories or pig machines with their sewage lagoons. And everywhere are shopping malls, subdivisions, and chemically treated lawns. I think of the hummingbirds stopping to sip from the red mallow flowers in my backyard. I think of the hawks I saw last weekend migrating by the millions south to their wintering grounds. When they come north again in the spring, will their territories still be there? Or will they be under the asphalt of shopping malls and houses? Where will they land? Is taking away animal habitat not abuse too? Finally, I'd like to point out a real hidden cost that applies to Professor Norcross's own example, chocolate. Over 40% of the coca beans for chocolate come from the Ivory Coast, where their cu cultivation is often dependent on something more terrible than animal mistreatment, child slavery. Children work dawn to dusk bearing brutal loads that deform them and are often fed only cornmeal and bananas. They're locked up at night in small sheds, sleeping crowded on planks, urinating in cans. The World Trade Organization does not have any labor standards. U.S. Senators Harkin and Engel maintain that major chocolate companies like Nestle's, Mars, and Hershey profit from child slavery and so sponsored the Harkin Angle Protocol on Chocolate and Child Slavery, a voluntary protocol against child slavery in today's political climate. That's all they could get past. And it expired last July without solving the problem. So should you forego chocolate? Maybe. Or you could choose fair trade chocolate or chocolate 
outlet from Venezuela. In a world of hidden costs, we have to inform ourselves, become politically active, minimize animal product consumption when it's in our control, but it's perhaps not worth offending grandma when she puts meatloaf on your plate. Should we all become vegetarians? I would argue the world is not that simple. Eating buffalo, which is organically and humanely reared and slaughtered, may preserve native prairies, for example. It is a complicated world. Take small steps that work for you. But in a world with mangoes and avocados in every supermarket, is there any real need for meat eating? I like the paper. I tend to agree with, with your rejection of the several proposals you consider for distinguishing Fred's puppy tormenting case and the more common meat consumption case. I also tend to agree with your rejection of the rationality gambit and for exactly the, the two reasons that you give. It, it falls a fall of the marginal cases problem and it appears to ignore the distinction between moral patients and moral agent. However, you also reach two concrete categorical moral conclusions. One, Fred's behavior is morally impermissible, and two, so is the behavior of the ordinary meat eater. Moreover, you also reach the more general and strongly egalitarian position, three, that humans and other sentient beings are on a par, morally speaking. You reject the common view that, quote, it is morally right to give the interests of humans greater weight than those of animals in deciding how to behave. I'm skeptical about the capacity of your largely convincing criticisms to discharge any of these three claims. Let me start with your concrete guilty verdicts regarding Fred and the ordinary meat consumer. While your paper does not give an account of what makes these behaviors wrong, it is quite obvious that you consider pain to be of utmost importance. This is borne out, for example, by your quote from Bentham, quote, the question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? But it is very reasonable to believe that if pain is important, so is pleasure. Even under your strong species egalitarianism, the beef eater's pleasure is just as important as the cow's pain. Suppose I consume three, cow three cows per year and that I'm also solely responsible for the suffering of three cows. I take great pleasure not only in eating delicious steaks, but also in barbecuing, smoking meat, hosting barbecue parties, etc. What makes you so sure that all this pleasure, the pleasure I, I take in eating and barbecuing three cows, is outweighed by the suffering of three cows. This strikes me as a tricky empirical question. The other point concerns your general and strong species egalitarianism. Your view is that we should not give the interests of humans greater weight than those of animals in deciding how to behave. On this view, a unit of guinea pig pain is just as important as a unit of human pain. Over the summer, we looked after a couple of guinea pigs for friends who chose to spend the summer in Europe. I have learned to, li to like these creatures and care for them up to a point. But I do not think I can bring myself to believe that they are morally on a par with my kids or their owners. As far as I can tell, you believe that they are morally on a par with their owners because you have not been shown a good argument to the contrary. This clearly assumes that the burden of proof is squarely on the other side. But on the face of it, human pain is more important than guinea pig pain. Humans are more important than guinea pigs. So it is only fair to expect a positive argument for species egalitarianism. Finally, and more tentatively, are we never entitled to hold moral views that are not and cannot be supported by argument? There are really two thoughts here. First. Some of the reasonable beliefs we have in other areas of discourse 
do not seem to be supported by rational argument. Every number has a successor. This is more than reasonable, and yet it is supported by neither argument nor observation. Second, moral claims cannot be justified other than by reference to other mo moral claims. This is the notion that you cannot derive an ought from an is. But if every moral claim requires justification, what you get is an infinite regress or a circle. This seems to suggest that at any given time, at least some moral claims must be taken more or less for granted. So if you think we should not take for granted the common assumption that humans are the primary patients of morality, what do you think we should take for granted? Thank, thank you, Hannick, and thank you, uh, Joan. Let's uh, give Alistair uh, a couple of minutes to defend himself. And uh, then uh, the microphones will circulate through the room. So as Alistair is speaking, be thinking about what questions you might want to ask uh, and ask them clearly. Right. Uh, well, I won't, I won't take very long. Um, uh, again, let me um, reiterate the thanks both to Joan and Anok. Um, first of all, I, I want to say to Joan, I agree with everything you said. And I didn't take, that I, take it that I was saying anything that was inconsistent with any of it. Um, I'm, I was, this talk was about animals, but there are many other talks one could give, and uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I was slightly worried about the chocolate example myself, given you know, recent research showing that it's good for you. So I was slightly worried about the force of it, because you know, part of the point is supposed to be that it's something which if you give up, you lose some pleasure, but you actually have, might gain some health, but who knows now. But uh, yes, I mean, uh, um, my advice would be to buy fair trade chocolate, and luckily there's quite a few places near Rice where you can do that, because um, I'm not going to give up chocolate because I don't need to torture puppies to get it. Um, and uh, yes, there are, there are hidden costs all over the place, and, and uh, some of what Joan said raised some issues that might be occurring to some of you, which have to do with the uh, possibility of humane farming. Um, my, the first part of my talk was clearly supposed to be about uh, factory farming, um, and didn't really say anything to the possibility of um, animals that are humanely raised. Um, now. Um, there are many issues um, which I don't, I can't go into right now. Uh, but from the perspective of an animal that's been genuinely humanely raised, that is, what one problem is that the humane farming standards in force in this country don't actually guarantee that an animal's life will be a decent life. But um, I'm sure there are some animals that are genuinely humanely raised and 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 killed in as humane fashion as possible. Um, there may be no objection from the perspective of that animal's welfare, but there may be many other reasons um, having to do with um, the use of the land. And so there are complex empirical questions about uh, the best use of land, um, but it seems fairly clear that the way we're using it now is not the best. Um, now, to, to uh, move to Hanok's um, question, first of all, the, um, uh, the example of the, of the guy who um, has three cows a year. Um, the, co the question is, is a bit more complex than, than you made out. It's n it wouldn't be enough for your pleasure from the cows to somehow be greater than the pain they suffer. Because from the perspective I'm arguing, the question is not, is the pain greater than the pleasure? The question is, how does this compare with your other alternatives? And so even if there's some sense in which we could quantify your pleasure and say, well, it's greater than the pain the cows suffer. And as an empirical matter, I, I don't think that's true of anybody, but um, it's clearly possible. Um, that's not the relevant question. The relevant question is, um, what are the alternatives available to you? And uh, um, could you have um, got nutrition and even fairly tasty nutrition without that, uh, without that suffering? Could you have attained anything like the same degree of pleasure? So part of the example would have to be not just that you get so much pleasure from eating the cows, but that you get pleasure that you couldn't possibly have got by any other means, any other non-animal torturing means. So that's, that's an important thing to bear in mind. It's, in, in discussing, say, utilitarian approaches, it's very easy to slip into the mistake of saying the pleasure has to outweigh the pain. But it, what we mean by that is it has to be greater than, and the, the balance has to be greater than available alternatives. Um, now, um, okay, so let me see. Um, 
the guinea pig's pain. Yes, I, um, well, I do think that the uh, guinea pig's pain is just as significant as the pain of, of uh, the like pain of any human. I don't think the guinea pig's life is as valuable for obvious utilitarian reasons. Um, but the pain of the guinea pig, uh, yes. Um, and um, you say the burden of proof is on the other side. Well, arguments about burden of proof can get kind of tedious, but it seems to me that once you accept the moral relevance of pain, um, the challenge is uh, there for you to explain why the guinea pig's pain is less morally significant. And if you, if you hold to it, and, and of course, you could always just hold that as a basic moral intuition, which I take it was you know, your suggestion. But what have I got to say against that? Someone who says, look, guinea pig's pain, less important than human being's pain. Of course, you can say that. But to the extent that that is obviously similar to people who say black people less important than white people, women less important than men, it's just a, I mean, what is a basic intuition for one person at one time is a very fragile thing. It's not so long ago that in this very country, it was a basic intuition that a black and a white person marrying each other outraged moral sensibilities. Um, and I, I mean, I, I agree that at some point we're going to get to basic moral intuitions. But I think we can do better than, uh, say, resting on the claim that an animal's pain is, is less significant than, the human, than a human's pain, especially if we can explain those intuitions and even justify them to an extent without having to accept them. There are good reasons why it's a good thing that you would save your children before the guinea pig, right? Um, and these reasons are quite consistent with the view that pain for pain, the guinea pig's pain is no less significant than your pain or your children's pain. So if we can actually explain why you have those intuitions and even to an extent justify some of them without having to admit that, well, there's just this basic intuition here that can't be justified. Where, on the other hand, we say, yeah, well, between humans, if I say she's more significant than he is, I do have to come up with morally relevant differences, but I don't have to do it between humans and guinea pigs. Is that, that's, what, that's what leaves me um, uh, uneasy, is the idea that, um, that I'm, I'm just going to stop the argument at that point. Um, now, I agree that, as with all moral arguments, you could just dig in your heels. Right? I mean, and, and, and I have met people who say, look, it's just plain obvious that eating meat is OK, and it doesn't matter how much the animals suffer. And yes, at some point, you, there's only so much you can do. And so a lot of the argument is persuasive. A lot of the argument also is, is, uh, count, is it's a consistency argument. A lot of what I'm doing is trying to convince you that given beliefs, certain beliefs that you have, you ought to adopt these other beliefs. So you can, of course, reject everything I say by, you know, right at the beginning, saying, yeah, it'd be fine to torture those puppies. Um, if you want to do that. Now, as a matter of fact, I don't believe that any of you believes that. And I think if anybody tries to believe that and then tries to back that up with some fancy account of, of, of their view of morality, they're lying. Um, and, and the way I could tell they're lying is that their behavior would not actually be consistent with claims like this. But anyway, I, I've, I've spoken enough. There's a lot more to say, and, and Hanok, you and I can, can talk about this a lot more. Thank you. I really <coughs> enjoyed your comments. I would be interested if you could say something about the use of animals in medical research uh, in the context of animal <coughs> suffering. Yes, I think that's a much more difficult topic. One reason why I didn't address it. Um, but I, I, have, I have written about that too. Um, the same issues arise. Right? The issues of the benefit um, compared with the harm. It seems that um, using animals in medical experiments is, on the face of it, more likely to be morally justified because in the case of eating animals, we now know that for almost every person, eating meat is not necessary, not just to survival, is not necessary for good health. For almost every person, there are some exceptions. Medical experiments, we can say that these these are cases where we can discover you know, wonderful things to enhance human health and prevent death, and we can only do that by using animals. And of course, to the extent that that's true, then there's a reasonable chance of justifying a certain limited use of animals. As a matter of empirical fact, the vast majority of animal experiments produce no good results. 
Um, some produce bad results. Thalidomide is the most notorious example, but there are many similar examples. Um, the vast majority of animals used in, in an experimental setting are used for commercial purposes. So the vast majority uh, have sort of products tested on them, products that we don't need, products that are there to maximize profits for drug companies, products that, that simply duplicate existing products. Um, so we could agree, you know, we could sit down and we could eliminate 95% of experiments. What about the remaining ones? In theory, yes. The problem is identifying the experiments which hold out some hope of enough benefit and which are such that we couldn't achieve anything like the same benefit without using animals. But I think in theory, though, um, we, we could get to that. I'll give you one anecdote. Um, when I was in Dallas, I was approached by a group who were uh, an animal welfare group who wanted me to comment on um, uh, an experiment that was being done with dogs, uh, which involved uh, cutting various uh, uh, um, amounts of the lungs out of puppies and then seeing how they you know, coped on treadmills. I mean, not immediately, but I mean, uh, the, the idea was, was seeing whether lung capacity could be compensated for. And there were some remarkable results, such as the more you cut out, actually the better they did, because there was some mechanism that only kicked in after a certain amount that was cut out. And um, I was asked, you know, as an ethicist, to comment on this. Well, I, I didn't know what to say. And the reason I didn't know what to say was I had no idea whether it was necessary to get these results and whether the results had any hope of benefit. And the reason I had no idea is the researchers didn't think it was worth addressing that question. So I think at the very least, researchers should, if they don't already, be aware that that's a question that they should address in their protocols and that it's much too easy to write a, uh, a research proposal in which you say, we might learn something which might benefit humans and just wave your hand at it. And at the very least, it, it's a question that needs to be taken seriously. But yes, I think that a certain amount of limited animal experimentation may be justified with the proviso that the treatment is as humane as possible, as much anesthetic used as is possible. And um, if, if, we could use, if we could achieve similar results without the use of animals, then we should. Uh, if I could just follow up, is it not true that there's some drugs and medicines that are made with animal parts? Um, would, would, would mm -hmm. these comments apply to that also? Uh, yes, yes, the comments would apply to, to that also. Um, and so those that, um, uh, medicines that could not be made except with animal products um, would have to be assessed in terms of how much good they do. Um, for example, cosmetics, I would say throw them all away. Next question is up here, but if I could just interject that when Huda Zagdi speaks to us in December, her talk is going to be on exactly that topic. I, I enjoyed your lecture. Thank but you. I have a question for you. It's kind of two parts. Mm -hmm. Part of it has to do with what if you're not sure that the, well, part of it has to do with, I noticed that you cross species, you're comparing humans to animals, right? Yeah. And how far does that go down the chain? In other words, do you include crawfish, shrimp, clams, and then would you then cross over to saying maybe plants suffer too, and we're just not sure? Sure. Uh, yes, good, good question. Um, and uh, my answer is uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, um, I was at a conference uh, two or three weeks ago with Peter Singer, who's maybe the best known advocate of animal welfare, um, and, and um, he was giving um, a talk on a similar topic, and I asked him, about uh, line drawing, and he said that from what he'd read of the research, he was fairly sure that scallops are below the line. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a serious question. I mean, the, uh, uh, from his perspective and my perspective are pretty much the same, ethically speaking. Right? We're utilitarians. And um, the question then is, can the creature suffer? Now, I think it's, um, I have seen no good reason to think the plants can suffer. Um, I'm not, it's not inconceivable that they suffer, but I've seen no good reason to think they can. Um, I think there are probably a range of creatures such that we are really uh, genuinely unsure about um, whether they suffer and how much they suffer. And th those are very difficult cases. You might say, well, if you're unsure, the safest thing to do is not eat them, you know, unless it's necessary to save your life or something like that. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't. Oh, are you guilty if you're not sure? Because let me just give you an example. So I went to Vietnam to my grandfather's um, what we call a wake party, right? And the whole village comes. And um, I don't eat pig or chicken, so I, I sat with the monks. 
because monks are invited and typically their table is safe. Their, their carpet is safe. And, um, but then after we ate, and they don't drink coffee either, okay? Oh and we have a lot of Vietnamese coffee there. Right. But they all got a Red Bull. And I was shocked that Red Bull was even in Vietnam, but... Um, <laughs> but and I, you're talking and about you know, the, the energy drink. Yes, the oh. energy drink, which okay. they said to me in Vietnamese, this is, a, you know, vitamins. And I happen to know it's probably 90% caffeine, which <laughs> is much more than drinking a coffee. Yes. And it was... So they were unknowingly drinking more coffee than they were trying to avoid uh, by not drinking coffee. I mean, right. so it's hard to uh, rationalize that. So I'm just wondering about the, when you don't know, uh, well, is that okay? <laughs> Are you saying, is ignorance okay? Is that the question? Um, <laughs> Um, well, I mean, regarding the monks, uh, one would have to look at why they don't drink coffee. If they don't drink coffee because they think coffee is wrong, but not caffeine, then it might be a, a, a strange view, but it might be consistent with drinking Red Bull. If they think caffeine is, is impermissible and they just don't know that caffeine's in Red Bull, then, um, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> that's a piece of ignorance that is easy to, cure, uh, to clear up. Um, in, in general, I, I mean, I think we have a certain responsibility to educate ourselves. Um, and to the extent we think that these issues are important, as I do, then I think it's important to you know, try to find out um, you know, how, um, you know, how our choices affect the welfare of other sentient beings, which couches it in this broad sense that, that Joan wanted. I mean, I think, I think we have the responsibility not just in the case of what we eat, uh, but also, I mean, not, certainly not just in the case of eating meat, but other things too. Um, products that we buy, um, whether we buy from companies that employ slave labor, whether even if it's not chocolate, if it's, uh, if it's you know, clothing. I, I think we have a certain amount of responsibility to educate ourselves, and it's not that difficult to educate ourselves about a whole bunch of things. If it's a question of where do you draw the line on the scale of sentience, then that's a very difficult issue, right? Because it's something that, I mean, I, I, I would defer to the scientists of, uh, about that. Um, if it's, a, if it's a question of, look, the, it's ignorance which is not just, I haven't looked in the right place. It's a topic that no one's yet agreed on, then the safest thing is to not eat it, um, I would say. But I, I would say the level of doubt when it comes to plants is non-existent. Um, I mean, I, I, um, I don't think there's any chance that plants suffer. One, one last. If you found yourself at the restaurant at the end of the universe, would oh, you yes. decline the dish of the day on moral grounds? No, no. The, as I understand the restaurant at the end of the universe, the, uh, the, the creature, the cow, whatever it is, um, really wants to be eaten, and it's, uh, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been tortured. Um, and no. Very humane. Very humane, yes. Yes, I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not... I mean, the, the notorious German cannibal case from last year or the year before, I, I, I'm not sure there was anything wrong with that. Uh, I mean, I... Um, I I, haven't, I don't have a handle on all the details, but no, I, I think, I mean, if it's really true that that cow will suffer far more distress by being <laughs> turned down, then no. In fact, you might even have a moral obligation to eat. But that's, of course, not the real world. Well, neither is, neither is the public. And unfortunately, the way things are going, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if we could ultimately breed just such an animal. I'm not sure how unfold. I mean, look, uh, more realistically, is the is the prob um, the likelihood of breeding an animal that uh, that produces meat without sentience. Right? So instead of an animal that sort of wants to be eaten, an animal that doesn't want or experience anything. Or bad. That's yeah. Th that's far more realistic. Um, now, w would that would it then be okay? Well, it would depend on the use of resources. It would also depend on health questions. Uh, I mean, just because no suffering. You know, just because this creature didn't suffer doesn't mean that it's the right dietary choice. It might be that by eating it, you're still condemning yourself to an earlier death, and, uh, uh, and you might also be misusing the environmental resources. I, it depend, would depend on the details. Um, but certainly the objections to factory farming wouldn't apply in such a case. Let's take one more quick one, and then we'll break for uh, reception. I'll be happy to answer questions, uh, um, you know, afterwards too. So, can you just further defend your argument that uh, cutting off the nose and limbs of a dog is the same as the treatment of factory animals? Because, I mean, a lot of the stuff that goes around the internet that she mentioned is rather exaggerated for 
dramatic effect. Mm -hmm. And I think you kind of do that in your paper. Right. Um, almost all factory raised chickens have their um, uh, claws sliced off uh, without anesthetic and have their beaks sliced off. So that's what, that's what I was comparing it to. Um, and and um, uh, all done without anesthetic. This isn't an ex exaggeration. This is the vast majority of factory raised chickens, of which there are 9 billion, uh, sorry, 8 billion, well, it was 98, 8 billion a year. Uh, vast majority do get their beaks sliced off. And in fact, uh, layers, chickens who lay eggs, have it worse because they live longer. So they often have two uh, de-beaking, uh, de-beakings in the course of their life because it starts to grow back. Um, so I think it's just, a, I mean, I, I could show you videos that would have taken more time. I don't think I exaggerated what happens on factory farms. De-beaking is incredibly painful, yes. It's, a, it, it, it's equivalent to, imagine um, the end of your finger, imagine the end being sliced off through your fingernail, through the end of your finger, yes. Uh, pigs and cows, uh, cows get ovariectomy without anesthetic. Uh, imagine, um, you know, if you're a woman, imagine somebody sticking their hand up you, ripping out your ovaries. Um, no, I mean, these, th these things are genuinely, horrifically painful. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, I mean... He's already had the microphone in his hand when I said one oh. more question, so let's give Mike a shot and then we'll work. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Is your um, argument that the moral status road from puppies to scallops, somewhere includes a cliff rather than being a steady gradient? The moral status from puppies to scallops is, uh, okay, you, you think, uh, is my argument that there's a sharp cutoff point? Yeah. I have no idea. Um, I, I, that would depend on the, um, the biological details. Um, I mean, my, my argument is that to the extent that creatures can experience pain or pleasure, their pains or pleasures count equally with the like pains or pleasures of any other creature. So if the scallop, I mean, let's say a sca uh, what's, what's a matter of degree is sort of how much capacity for experience a creature has. So maybe, maybe a, um, a shrimp um, can experience sort of rather you know, feeble states of pleasure or pain. Well, my claim is that that feeble pain of the shrimp is just as bad as a similarly feeble pain of any other creature. But of course, if it's only capable of experiencing a feeble pain, the practical consequence might well be that we can raise them um, without the same kind of moral risk that we um, engage in when we raise other creatures, because I mean, maybe they just can't suffer really greatly. So. Um, to, I mean, so, so you've got to understand that there, there might be a, a gradual diminution in practical relevance, but there's no diminution in the principle of equal consideration. Right? To the, if a creature can have an experience that's either positive or negative in value, pleasurable or painful, then that experience has the same moral significance as the exact same moral experience, intrinsically speaking. Because, of course, again, there are all kinds of reasons. Human beings, you know, it's often argued, well, hey, our pains and pleasures are more significant. Why? Not because they're more significant than themselves, because of our greater cognitive abilities. We remember. So if I torture you, it'll scar you for life. If I torture a chicken, maybe you won't remember it. But of course, you have to be aware that arguments like this cut both ways. Right? And Peter Singer is very clear about this. The arguments cut both ways. Our greater cognitive capacities might make some treatment of us worse, but it might make some treatment of it better. And his example is a good one. If I snatch you off the streets, to perform experiments on you, you're not going to be too happy about that. But if I tell you and you trust me that these experiments are relatively painless and non-life-threatening, I'm going to release you, it will be a less you know, uh, terrible experience for you than if I snatch a creature that's incapable of understanding these things. So our greater cognitive abilities can mitigate some things and amplify others. So there's no, we can get no general argument from the claim that we have greater cognitive abilities which, you know, therefore inter which interact with our sensations to the claim that our, um, you know, our experiences are somehow more or less morally relevant. That's my, that's my position.